The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 5, reading verses 8, 9, and 10. Verses 8, 9, and 10 in the fifth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. Now, these words come uh, immediately following the first seven verses in this fifth chapter of the prophecy, prophecy of Isaiah, which we considered together last Sunday evening. There, as I tried to show you, the prophet, as was uh, almost invariably the case with him, that was his particular method, and indeed it's a very good method. He always starts out by stating the whole case. And then he proceeds to take it up in particular and to illustrate what he's already said in general. Now, last Sunday night, in looking at those first seven verses, we saw that the prophet was delivering his message to his contemporaries in the form of a poem, in the form of a picture. And through that picture... He conveyed God's message to his contemporaries, the children of Israel. He says that in the seventh verse, the vineyard of the Lord is the the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression for righteousness, but behold a cry. Now the message we found in general was this. Israel is, after all, but a pattern, an illustration, an example, which God has set before the whole of the human race in order to convey his great message to the whole of mankind. God is the God of the whole world. He made it all and everything that's in it, and it all still belongs to him. So the message of God to the children of Israel is, in a larger sense, the message of God to the whole of humanity. And we saw that the message could be summarized in some such form as this, that man's greatest trouble is due to his ignorance of his own true nature. He doesn't realize who he is and what he is, how he has been made by God and the whole object and purpose of his being. The second thing we saw was the utter irrationality unreasonableness of man's rebellion against God and what he does instead of keeping the law of God. Instead of being a luscious grape, he is a wild grape. Instead of bringing forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes that are useless and bitter and sour. And it's utterly unreasonable. Furthermore, we saw that there is an element of perversion in it. That man is no longer straight, he's no longer as God made him, he's become something else. His whole nature is vitiated. In other words, the problem of the human race is not a superficial problem, it's a very profound problem. What's wrong with all of us by nature is not something on the surface. It's something down in the very character and essence of our being. Wild grapes instead of the choicest grapes growing from the choicest vine which God originally made and planted. And lastly, we saw that men in all this is utterly inexcusable, that God, even God, has exhausted everything that he could do for us. He puts it in these plaintive words. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? What more could God have done than he's done by sending his only son into the world and even to the death of the cross. Man is utterly inexcusable. And there's only one hope for him, and that is that he should realize it ere it is too late and repent and turn back to God 
lest the wrath of God descend upon him. Now then, there's, there's the great picture. There it is all, as it were, in a nutshell. But now having done that, the prophet goes on. And he goes on now to give us particular examples and illustrations of what he's thus stated by putting his case in general. Now somebody may very well ask the question, are these uh, particulars necessary? Is there any need for us to bother our heads about them at all? Isn't it enough that we should have that general picture, that general message? Why did the prophet proceed uh, to put these particulars in, some, in terms of six woes? Why wasn't he content with just delivering his general message? Now, there are many people who hold that view at the present time. They say they like a general message, but they object to these particulars. You know, it's the same objection that people have to a personal gospel. There are many people who have no objection to the gospel at all, as long as it remains in the realms of general ideas and generalities. But the moment it becomes personal, the moment it's applied, the moment it begins to put a pressure upon us and to call upon us to do something, they object to it. They dislike it. They say this is abominable, it's an impertinence. I'm interested in ideas, but I, I don't like this personal element. Now, that's the same objection as the objection that many people have to the particulars, which the Bible nevertheless always puts before us. The Bible never stops at generalities. It always brings it down to the particular. Why does it do this? I think this is a very important question. Well, it does it, I say, very largely for that reason I've just been giving. It does it in order to bring the truth right home to us and to produce a real conviction. Now, I could illustrate this to you in many, many different ways. Whether I've ever used this illustration before or not, I don't know. But at any rate, it does illustrate the point so well that I'm going to utter it once more. I want to show you that the general is not enough, that we must come down to particulars. And the instance, the illustration that comes to me is this. I remember once hearing a very eloquent statesman delivering a great oration. And the theme was the sanctity of international contracts. And the theme obviously was the importance of a bond, of a solemn word, the sanctity of international contracts. Here was a great principle. Britain was then fighting in the First World War and fighting for this great grand principle. And while the man was able to speak so eloquently on the general principle, he was not being loyal to his own marriage contract. See, it's very well to get excited about the sanctity of international contracts. You talk about general ideas and great principles. But my dear friend, the question is, do you really believe in the sanctity of contracts? And the way you discover that is by not discussing general principles and ideas, but by examining your own life. Are you actually observing contracts, in that case the marriage contract, in your own personal life and conduct? Now that's one of the reasons for always bringing the general down to the particular. It brings it home to us. It's all right to sit down and say, yes, that's a fine principle. But are we really in agreement? We've got to examine ourselves. The particular will make us do that. Secondly, particulars, after all, are but illustrations of the general. They belong to the general. That is, the relationship of particular and general. The particular is a particular of the general. And therefore, it's a very good way of illustrating it. And as I say, we're all helped by illustrations. We don't always see a principle until an illustration is used. Ah, we say, now I've got it. I couldn't quite get it as a principle. But now, as you put it in a concrete instance like that, I see exactly what you're talking about. That is the value of all pictures and of illustrations. It is the particular illustrating the general. So, it helps us still more to understand 
that general and to make certain that we do indeed grasp it. But there is a third value in these particulars, and this is the one that I am particularly interested in as we look at this first illustration tonight, and as I hope to look at the others following with you, God willing, and it is this. The particulars as we have them here, if they did nothing else, they do this. They show us that in spite of the passage of the centuries, man still remains what he has always been. The particulars, you see, if I make a statement, man doesn't change. Man essentially remains absolutely what he's always been. Somebody may take it up and say, oh, that's all right. It's all very well to make a statement like that. But how do you prove to us that man is still what he's always been? My answer is this, that I find that some 2,800 years ago, the prophet Isaiah, picks out some six glaring things that were wrong in the life of his nation, in the life of men in sin and out of the knowledge of God. And I'm afraid it's going to be but too easy a task for me to show you that these are the main problems confronting Great Britain and every other civilized nation in the world tonight, indeed every uncivilized nation also. The particulars help us to see in a way that nothing else can that sin is still sin and that man is still man exactly as he has been through all his known and recorded history. Very well. In other words, I'm going to show you that the characteristics of life then are still the characteristics of life now. Now then, they are put here, I say, in the form of these woes. Woe unto them, says the prophet. He's delivered his general verdict. He's now going to put it in particulars. Why is God concerned? Why is God going to punish the nation of Israel? Well, if you're in any doubt, says the prophet, I'll tell you in detail. It's because you're guilty of this and this and this and this and this and that. There are your particulars justifying the general verdict of wrath and of condemnation. Now then, we're looking at the first tonight. Well unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ear, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. Your ten acres will only give you that which is just uh, something like a thimble full, looked at in terms of comparison. And the seed of an hermer, instead of using an ab- giving an abundant crop, shall yield only an ephah. Now then, what's the meaning of this? What is the prophet castigating here? Upon what is God pronouncing this first woe? And the answer is materialism, worldliness. Now, in that ancient civilization, of course, it was mainly a matter of houses and of fields. That was the kind of life they lived. It was an agricultural community in the main Israel was an agricultural community, so these points are put in the Old Testament imagery, naturally, in terms of houses and in terms of fields and animals. But the principle is the thing that matters, and the charge that God is bringing here against the nation through the prophet is what we now call materialism, worldliness. Now, you see what I meant just now uh, when I said that if this does nothing else, it shows us that man remains what he's always been, that sin remains what it's always been, that there's no change whatsoever. There is nothing that is so blind as that a man should say, oh, well, you know, I don't see what the Old Testament's got to do with me. Don't you? I hope I'll show you tonight that it's got everything to do with you. Because you, my friend, though you are alive in 1964, is, are exactly what man was 
800 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The main problem there, the first at any rate, was materialism. What is it tonight? Materialism. Worldliness. It is still exactly the same thing. Us, to most of us here in London, well, I must be careful. Perhaps it is houses, but it isn't fields, is it? Our type of life has changed, but that's merely a superficial change. We think now in terms of money and what money can buy, possessions, goods, everything that becomes ours as the result of money. And here, I say, is the very essence of the modern problem. Christianity is at a great discount in this country. People are not interested in it. Only 10% claim any interest in it. And half those, well, have a very doubtful interest in it, to say the very least. What's the matter? What's the matter with the 90, 95%? Why are they not interested in Christianity? The answer is because they're materialists. Because they're interested in this other thing. Exactly as the children of Israel turned away from God, so men have turned away from God in this century, and they're interested in materialism. Possessions, goods, things, everything that results from the possession of money. And, of course, everything in the world is encouraging men and women to do this. This is the year of a general election. And the parties are beginning to get ready. I'm not very interested, and I'll tell you why. Because all the parties are encouraging this self-same thing. Of course, they do it to get votes, to buy votes. And they know their constituents very well indeed. And they know the man who promises the most is the man who's likely to get the vote. You don't need to be a profound psychologist to know that, but the politicians do know that. And so they will compete with one another in offering more and more and saying that their offer's better than the other one. And they'll all say the same things. I'm convicting all of them of the same thing. Namely, that they're encouraging a spirit of materialism in men and women. That they're very little interested in principles, any of them. Now, that doesn't say that we shouldn't have politics. You've got to govern your country. But, oh, that we had politics which was concerned about truth and about principles, about morality and living, and not merely pandering to the lusts and the desires of men and women. Something for nothing. The politicians are all encouraging this. So are the newspapers, perhaps even more. That's why they're one of the worst influences in the world tonight. Giving the impression always that that's the real life, the life of money and of possessions. Encouraging it in every way, almost. Always holding it before us and parading it. You get exactly the same in all these other great media of communication, television, radio, and all the rest of them. The whole world, you see, is preaching materialism. It's not interested in the spiritual. But it's telling us to concentrate on this life and this world. It thinks it's clever in talking about pie in the sky. The practical man, hard-headed man. No, no, that's not his trouble. It's that he's soft, that he doesn't think, that he doesn't know how to reason. Let me prove my contention to you. And woe is pronounced upon this. Why? Well, look at the characteristics of such an outlook. Let's examine it as it's revealed to us here. Here is the thing in which men burst today, this materialistic outlook. What are its characteristics? Well, the first thing we must note about it is its smallness. It's smallness. What a little life it is. Fancy identifying life with a number of houses or a number of fields. But you see, that's what people do. By doing this, they're expressing their philosophy of life. They're expressing their view of themselves. That is to be a man, to possess more. Now, we've got a great illustration of this, and I hold it before you because it is the last word on this very subject. You'll find it in the 12th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Our Lord was preaching one afternoon and preaching one of the most mystical sermons that he ever preached about the relationship 
of man to God. He was talking about time and talking about eternity and warning men and women not to deny him amongst men but ever to be true to him and warning them against the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Those were the things he was talking about. But this is what I read in Luke 12, 13. And one of the company said unto him, You see, the moment our Lord stops, as it were, to take his breath, a man blurts out and says, One of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he, our Lord, said unto the men, Men, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And then he said unto them, he turned to the whole company and he said, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Why did our Lord speak like that? Well, you see, the answer is perfectly obvious. Here is our Lord speaking about ultimate matters, about the highest mysteries and wonders of life and eternity. And here's a man in the congregation looking into the face of the Son of God, but he's really not listening to him at all. Why, oh, because to him it isn't your relationship to God and heaven and the soul and the Holy Spirit that matters, but some inheritance. There was a dispute between him and his brother about a bit of ground or about some houses. So the moment our Lord stops, he blurts out his question, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And our Lord turns upon him and says, man, who made me a judge or a divider amongst you? He says, do you think I've left the courts of heaven and come into this world and am enduring all that I'm enduring in order to settle some little problem like that of dividing an inheritance, some little dispute about property and money. Man, do you think that I've come from him to do that? And then he turns to the whole congregation and he says, take heed and beware of covetousness. Why? Well, he says, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth, but that is the view of life, which is taken by this kind of person. What makes a man a man? Well, the number of houses he's got, the number of fields, the amount of money he's got in the bank, the things he can buy, the goods, the gadgets. We call them status symbols today, don't we? But it's the same thing. That's what makes a man a man, and that's what makes you great. You've got more of the status symbols than somebody else, the things that you buy with money. Oh, what a conception of life. What a conception of man. The thing is so small, it's so abysmally small, that a nature, a man, a man's life, a man's being and existence, reduced to things that can be bought with money. I say again that if I had no other reason for being a Christian, this is enough for me. That non-Christian view of life, it makes men such a small creature. It estimates him and judges him in terms of goods and possessions and things that he possesses. And knows nothing about his soul and his spirit. And the thing that links him to God and the possibilities of eternity, it knows nothing about it. It is so small, it's an insult to human nature. But not only that, it's utterly debased. Our Lord again has put this so perfectly. He says, where your treasure is there, will your heart be also? You see, he had to deal with the same problem. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? He says, these are the things that the Gentiles are concerned about. He says, don't you be interested in those things. That's what the ungodly are interested in. And they are, of course, and they always have been. That's what makes life to them. And so the competition goes on. My dress, the other woman's dress, my house, his house, the number of them, the fields, the car, and all these other things, status symbols. This is life, and people can't sleep at night because of this. The worry, the anxiety, the jealousy, and the envy, and all the rivalry and quarreling. What is man? What is life? Oh, status symbols. Number of things that he possesses. That's the view which is taken of life. And I say it's ultimately so debased. You see, the heart is there that 
that men, well, that men should be concerned about these things, it's all right, there's nothing wrong in possessing things in and of themselves. The Bible isn't unreasonable. There are things which are necessary, and the Bible doesn't prohibit them. But when you set your heart on them, when you identify yourself with them, and when you can't live without them, then you're a slave, says the Bible. You're not a man, you're a slave. Men can possess things, but when he is possessed by the things, that is nothing but sheer slavery. And a man's heart is taken up with these things, and I say it is utterly debasing. Our Lord says about this, look here, he says the life is more than the raiment. The life is the thing that matters. The soul, not the clothing, not the food, not the houses, not the fields, not the possessions. You see, that's in it. It's small and it's debased. But look at this horrible greed that comes out here. Woe unto them that join house, to house, they field, to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. It's a lust, of course, and it's nothing but a lust. And once you get involved in this, you'll never be satisfied. That is the meaning of lust. It's an inordinate affection. And a, an affection is all right, but when it becomes inordinate, it's all wrong. A desire is all right, but a lust is terrible. It means that you're governed and controlled by it, and you'll never have enough. And here it is. It's typical of these people. The modern world is full of this. But I must emphasize this one particular aspect of its selfishness. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, listen, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Nobody else to be seen. I've bought up all the houses, or at least I've got them somehow, and I've got all the fields, and I'm alone in the middle of it all, and I own so much that I can't see anybody else, and I'm at last hoping to get satisfaction for myself. The utter selfishness of it all. Nobody counts but I myself. Now that's why I read to you at the beginning that story of Naboth's vineyard. He'd got great possessions of vineyards. He has a, Ahab the king had great possessions of vineyards. He has a little man. He's only got one vineyard. His name is Naboth. It's come down in the family. He isn't a great possession. He's just got this one vineyard. The king wants this because it's near his and he wants to turn it into a garden of herbs. The man's living and lively and where his fathers and grandfathers and all his forefathers have lived. The king wants this and because Naboth quite justifiably is not prepared either to sell it to him or take anything else for it because this is his home after all and he has a right to it and he's always lived there. The king can't sleep, he can't eat his food. He's miserable and unhappy and turns his face to the wall like a baby. And then comes that subtle woman Jezebel and says, It's all right, be a man. Aren't you governing? I'll soon get that for you. And remember what she did. She encompassed the murder of this innocent poor man, Naboth. And they thought all was wonderful. Naboth's dead. Go and possess your vineyard. And they went into the vineyard. Read that story when you go home. 1 Kings 21. And listen to the verdict of God upon it all. And it was literally fulfilled. The terrible end of both Ahab the king and the still more terrible end of Jezebel, that scheming, vicious woman. That's the story. But look at the selfishness involved. Not considering anybody but himself. Who's Naboth? What's the matter about his personal feelings? What's the matter? Why, do, why does his family pride count? Nothing counts but my family pride. My bigness. Who is he? What right is he to refuse? Take it. Now, I don't want to keep you, my dear friends, but you know this is the whole trouble in the world tonight. That's what makes a Hitler. That's exactly what was the trouble with Hitler. He called it Lebensraum. This great nation must have more room to expand. And he'd have been satisfied with nothing less than the world. All your world conquerors, so-called men who try to be, are animated by this self-same spirit. Thinking of nobody but themselves. They want to be alone. It's not only true of tyrants like this, it's true of the individual. Isn't this the main cause of these industrial disputes at the present time? 
Can they be justified? There was a time when they were more than justified, when men were not given a decent living wage. I lived through that period in the 1930s. I began my ministry immediately after the general strike and the six-month coal strike of 1926. And I saw men and women and children on the verge of starvation. It was a scandal. But it's no longer a scandal. Men who are well paid come out on strike. Why? Status symbols again, you see. Though they're being well paid, somebody's being paid more. Why shouldn't I have it? And so you may risk the whole future industrially of your nation. What's the nation matter? It's I that matter. And that's the principle, the spirit that you have not only amongst the working classes, but also amongst the employers. It's true on both sides. It's true all round. Everybody's out for himself. We are all defending by nature personal interests, and it's all nothing but a manifestation of sheer selfishness. What do other people's feelings matter? What do the feelings of a wife and children matter if a man's lust is to be satisfied? Or what do the feelings of a husband and children matter if a wife's lusts are to be satisfied? Hence, the trouble and the heartbreak and the problem of life today, this selfish spirit that comes in and it's an expression of this godless materialistic outlook upon the whole of life. If they think they can get a better time with another man, well, they can be bought. Wives can be bought by men with money and they leave a house full of children in order to have the supposed good time that money can buy. Materialism. And it's all utterly selfish. But let me come to something more important. There is the prophet's analysis of it, but what's the real cause of it? What leads to this? And the answer is quite simple. In mine ears, says the prophet, said the Lord of hosts. The prophet sees how wrong this is. How does he come to see that it's wrong? Oh, God has whispered into his ear. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts. God has spoken and he's heard. He believes it. He sees it's right. So he sends on the message. But you see, the trouble with the other person is that he forgets God. God is not in all his thoughts. That is the essence of the modern man's problem and it leads to all his dilemmas and all his unhappinesses. Man has forgotten God. That's what's wrong. You see, many men think that they're putting into practice Christian principles that won't help you at all if you've forgotten God. A man can take up the Sermon on the Mount as a kind of philosophy and say, now we must try and persuade both sides of industry and so on to apply this. It's no good. If man doesn't remember God, principles are of no value. Man regards himself as some sort of autonomous being. He thinks he's the center of life. The moment you turn your back on God, you make yourself a God. And man is the center of life, he's the center of the universe. He is the determiner of his own fate, he is his own ruler, and he decides what is right and what is wrong. And that is what is happening in the world at the present time. You see, that was man's original sin. As I was showing you last Sunday night, he was put into this world by God. He was put into paradise. The devil came and said, Hath God said? Quite right, says men. What right is he to say? Turn your back on God. We will decide. And so all troubles entered into the life of men. The original sin was the sin of forgetting God and turning their backs upon him. And hence all the troubles. In mine ears saith the Lord of hosts. And this is the message to the world tonight from this book and from God. God, my dear friend, is still over all. The world is his, it's still in his hands, and our times are entirely and altogether in his, his, his hands. You see, these children of Israel, they turned their backs on God. They went on living as if there wasn't a God. But you see, that makes no difference whatsoever to God. Not the slightest. God is and God remains. 
things, and God is over all, and the world is still his, and there he is looking down upon it all, and he is speaking. And what he tells us is this, that as the world is his, the most important thing for us is to know something about him. For we'll never know ourselves until we know something about God. Man only knows himself when he realizes he's made by God and in the image of God. And God has revealed his character. What is it? Well, he's holy. He is just. He is righteous. He is a God of equity. He's a God of fairness. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And as he is the maker and the controller of the world, he is the judge of the world. Now, here is the message, you see. Man goes on living as if there were no God. He insults himself and his own nature. He debases himself. He perverts himself. He makes himself a contemptible creature. And at the whole time, God's looking down upon it. And not only does man get his own troubles and make his own troubles, God is in his wrath looking down upon it. And remember, in mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the hosts of heaven, the Lord and master of all those great angelic beings and powers and principalities, the Lord who is omnipotent, to whose power there is no limit whatsoever, the Lord who is absolute and who reigns and rules over all, the Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. That's his message, that's his announcement. He is a Lord of illimitable power and authority and control. There is nothing that he cannot do. And he has declared his will. God has declared throughout the running centuries that all this life of materialism and smallness and selfishness and greed and lust is abomination in his sight. He said more. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You'll find that statement twice over in this prophecy of the prophet Isaiah. And I feel that this is the word that this generation needs amongst all the others and most of all amongst all others. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Doesn't matter how clever you are, doesn't matter how able, doesn't matter how wealthy... There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. If you're wicked, you won't have peace. You can add house to house and field to field. You can imitate Ahab and Jezebel. You'll get no peace. God has pronounced this from the very beginning. Now then, I want to take you a step further. God has not only pronounced all this. God has acted according to his pronouncement. And the world tonight is not only guilty of God, guilty of forgetfulness of God, it is equally guilty of forgetfulness of history. When will we learn from history, my friends? There's a great history of this world behind us. Have a look at it, examine it, try and learn from it. I know that it's a futile thing for me to tell you to do that. For I've quoted you before the dictum of that great German philosopher Hegel, who wasn't a Christian, but he said this, history teaches us that history teaches us nothing. You would have thought that the war of 1914-1918 would have taught us something. It taught us nothing. Has the last war taught us anything? It doesn't look like it, does it? History teaches us that history teaches us nothing. Man's ignorant of history, for if he were not ignorant of history, he'd be behaving in a very different matter. Woe, saith the Lord, woe unto them, saith this Lord of hosts. And that's what he's been saying from the beginning. That's what he said, you know, before the flood. The generation of people before the flood have turned their backs upon God. You remember how they were living? Our Lord has told us, as they were, he says, in the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, planting and sowing, until the flood came and washed them all away. 
The whole trouble of the generation before the flood was just materialism. God didn't matter. They turned their backs upon God. They could live a better life. And so instead of worshipping God and being led by him, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, exactly as they are today. They hadn't got newspapers then, and you couldn't get the photographs of the film stars of those days on your front pages, but everybody was talking about it. Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. This man's committed adultery. He's gone away with another woman. The world was full of that sort of thing before the flood. And God said, this is abomination. All the imaginations of the thoughts of men's heart are only evil continually. And he said, I will destroy it. And he did. That's history. Exactly the same in Sodom and Gomorrah. You have precisely the same conditions there. I needn't keep you. The very name Sodom tells you all about that, doesn't it? And London is Sodom. And high society and low society are living in Sodom today. Sodom and Gomorrah, the life of the cities of the plain, materialism, wonderful life. Lot chose it, you see, thinking he was clever, leaving his uncle Abraham to have the mountain tops for his sheep. Life of the cities, society, civilization, wonderful. Sodom and Gomorrah, God said what he thought about it, and he carried out what he said. I've reminded you of the end of this men. Ahab, king of Israel, and his wife Jezebel. She was actually eaten by dogs, and her skull was broken. A horrible end to both the husband and the wife. You know, this is the great story that is unfolded in the Bible. Great nations arise, Assyria, Babylon. They don't believe in God. They believe in themselves and in their wealth and power. And God gets up, having allowed them to go to a certain point, and blows upon them, and they've gone. Babylon, Greece, where are they? Egypt, it was once one of the greatest nations in the world with the most astounding civilization. Look at it now and look at it as it's been for centuries. Rome, where is her greatness? Greece, all these great empires. Every attempt at world domination has always ended in the same way. It's all epitomized so perfectly in that man who, speaking naturally, was such a great man, the Emperor of Napoleon, who went out to conquer the world. And where did he end? Confined to a little island in the South Atlantic. How different is the result from the dream? How different is the end product from the ambition? No, no, God has said this and God has done this. And you know, my dear friends, he's still saying this and this is his message tonight. God is going to punish this materialistic age. He's already doing so. How does he do it? Well, he tells us here he turns it all to desolation. Man says, I'm going to join house to house and lay field to field till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ear, saith the Lord of hosts, of the truth, tell them this. Many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Your great houses will be ruins. There'll be no men and women there. The animals will be there, and the ivy will be there, and the moth will be there, and the rust will be there. Desolation. And God's going to do it. God won't allow this. Now, there's a very extraordinary statement of all this in the 45th chapter of this prophet Isaiah in the 7th verse. Have you ever considered the meaning of this? Let me read it to you. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. What's he mean by saying he creates evil? What he means is this. Not that he creates wrong, but that he does bring to pass the evil consequences of men's sin. God says, you gather your fields, you gather your houses, I will turn them into desolation. When men sinned, God cursed the earth. And in spite of all men's frantic endeavors and brilliant organization ever since, in all his vaunted civilizations... He can't get rid of the curse, the thorns and the briars, the moth and the rust. So our Lord says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. That is life in this world. Do you do what you like? You can't stop it. The moth, the rust, 
unobserved will suddenly be doing its own insidious work and what you've built up will be made desolate because God has cursed the earth and manifests his judgment in this way. Now, I want in a very brief word to show you the terribly important relevance of all this to this century in which you and I live and into which we belong. We are living in an age, my dear friends, when we are seeing the dissolution of things that people thought were eternal. Sir Winston Churchill said during the war that he had not been called to office to preside at the dismemberment of the British Empire, but he actually did that, you know. Who would have thought a hundred years ago that what has happened by now would have been true? What's happened to India and these countries in Africa? People who believed in the British Empire. What do they say now? We've seen the whole world being turned upside down. We've seen the loss of accumulated wealth. The richest nation in the world has become one of the poor ones. You can't play fast and loose with these things. God is over all. The Lord of hosts. He's still reigning. You plan, you scheme, you go on without him. And you put your faith in these things and give your heart to these things. You'll find you'll have nothing but desolation. Now there's some terrible examples of this at the present time. Do you know one of the greatest fears and anxieties of some of the leading scientists in the world at this moment? Do you know what it is? It is the fear of famine. It is the fear of starvation. Now, I'm not saying this. Some of the acutest observers who are not Christians, they're terrified at the prospect of famine and starvation. Why? Well, there are two main reasons. One is the amazing phenomenal increase in the world population the number of mouths to be fed. But the other side is the lack of food. Why is there a lack of food? Ah, you see, this is where the principle comes in. You know, one of the greatest causes of trouble will be what is called soil erosion. What's soil erosion? Well, you hear about the sand bowls in America and in parts of Canada. What are these sand bowls? I'll tell you. Men went there, you see, and there was this soil, this virgin soil. Now then, they said, wonderful, we want to make a fortune. So we'll take crop after crop after crop out of this soil. We'll put nothing in, no money or nothing. This is virgin soil. We'll get out all we want. It'll last in our lifetime. And they cut down all the trees, which are the natural protection and the source of moisture. They got rid of them all. The more land, the better. Pull up the trunks. So have your great farms, your wonderful acres. Get all you can out of it. And they've got all they can out of it. And there's nothing left but sand, sand bowls. Soil erosion is the result of the destruction of your great forests, which is nature's way of preserving these things. And so you see that in this wonderful 20th century, when man has come to his own, and when scientific knowledge has advanced so far, our greatest problem is likely to be starvation, lack of food. Isn't it ironical? Yes, but it's just a fulfillment of the biblical message. You gather land and field to field without God, and you'll find that your wonderful fields will come to this. Ten acres of vineyard shall yield just one bath. Ridiculous. And the seed of an homer, instead of multiplying itself almost endlessly, shall yield just an ephah. You'll sow great quantities, but your soil is so hopeless because it's become desolate that it'll give you nothing. These things come back, don't they? They don't work out as we think that they're going to. And, of course, we are seeing this great thing perhaps more clearly than anywhere at the present time in the United States of America. What's the greatest problem in the United States today? Well, it's the color problem, isn't it? The color problem. But how has the color problem ever come into being? Why is there a color problem? You know the answer? Because of slavery. They wanted to make money quickly. You make money quickly by getting men to work for you who are slaves. You buy them for a pittance and then they do their work for nothing. Wonderful, said those men of 200 years ago and up to 100 years ago during the American Civil War. Marvelous. We're getting labor for nothing. We're going to make great fortunes. We've gone full cycle. It's the major problem today. The problem of the colored person. The problem has been created by greed. 
by avarice, by materialism, by a failure to submit utterly and absolutely to God. Indeed, this has been almost ridiculous at times. Haven't you read any of the newspapers now and again? In fact, it happened again to the United States. She uh, had a problem a few years back. I mean, an, a problem in the realm of commerce and of trade. What was her problem? Well, her problem was this, that she'd got practically all the gold of the whole world. We'd all become her debtors, and we'd all paid all our gold to her, so that now she'd got all the gold, but she'd got no customers because nobody'd got any money to pay. Now, it sounds funny, doesn't it? But you see, that's the very thing Isaiah was saying. You go on amassing it all. It'll turn to desolation in your hands. It'll become your greatest problem. Well, now, there it is in general and in terms of states and countries and empires. But, my dear friend, it's equally true of the individual. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And if you try to live this life of the materialistic outlook and banish God from your thoughts and think you can get satisfaction in things and goods and possessions, you'll never be satisfied. Never. There'll always be somebody who's got more. Or you'll feel that you're not having your right or a thief comes in or moss and rust corrupt and you think you're losing things and you are and the things you value no longer count. They go out of fashion and you're left penniless. It's like that in life. But then you come to the end of your life. And what have you got? You've got nothing. Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. I can't take these things with me. I'm nothing but a soul after all. But I've neglected my soul. What shall it profit a man? Though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul. God won't allow man to have satisfaction in things for he's made him for himself and man is too big for this. God won't allow man to insult himself. God blows upon it all and it all becomes desolation and at the end man is left in a final hopelessness and despair. Woe unto them, says God. The Lord of hosts in mine ears hath said and what he has said he always and certainly performs. He's doing it before our very eyes today, nationally, internationally, individually. Is there any hope? Is there any way out? Of course, that's why God sends the prophet. You see, though this is so true of us, though we are such fools as to make ourselves so small and insult ourselves and deface the image of God in his great and glorious love, he doesn't abandon us. He is message is not only a message of wrath there is also a message of mercy he raised these prophets to call the nation to repent to think again to realize what they were doing and ere it was too late to turn back to him and to listen to him and to his ways and again they should be blessed and my dear friend, he does the same with you and with me tonight if we've never heard this message before. This is his message to this modern materialistic age that is already beginning to find its flowers withering in its hands and all its glittering prizes becoming tawdry nothing. This is his message to it. Don't spend your time thinking about things. Don't insult yourself by saying that a man's life consisteth in the, the abundance of the things that he possesseth. Don't become a hunter of status symbols. You're a man. Don't spend your time just talking about what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed or how many houses have we got or how many fields or what sort of car we run or what kind of cut I have in my coat or any one of these things that men regard as everything and vital stop says this son of God seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness put that first all these other things shall be added unto you you'll have enough and more than enough to satisfy you while you're in this life and in this world but you will have started with your soul 
You'll be right with God. You'll therefore succeed in time. You'll succeed in death. You'll succeed throughout the countless ages of eternity. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't live for that. Don't set your heart on things like that. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal and the terrible thief of them all is death and he comes and takes everything. What then? Well, lay up yourselves for yourselves treasures in him where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. My dear friend, You know the Son of God came into this world in order to purchase a great inheritance for you and for me. And when he rose again from the dead, having conquered our every enemy, do you know what he did? Well, according to the Apostle Peter, he did this. He hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection from the dead, unto an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in him by God for all who believe in him. If your treasure is in this world, well, if they do let off one of these atomic bombs, you'll have nothing left. But even if they don't do that, when you die, you'll have nothing left. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, You will have an inheritance that is incorruptible. Nothing can ever destroy it. It's undefiled. It's pure. No moth, no wrath, no rust, no thief can ever enter in. Incorruptible and undefiled. And it fadeth not away. Let the world go mad in a final cataclysm and destroy itself. Your life is hid with Christ in God and your inheritance will never fade away. There is still time. Where's your heart? Where's your treasure? What do you value? What is life in your estimate and opinion? What do you really think of yourself? Are you ready for death? Are you ready for eternity? Here's the opportunity. Repent. Think again. Acknowledge your folly. Seek first the kingdom of God by accepting this message that God sent his only son into the world, and not only that, he sent him to die on the cross to bear the punishment of your guilt and folly and sin, and in him he gives you new life and the promise of this inheritance that shall never fade away. Beloved people, listen to the word of God. Listen to history. Repent if you've never done so, and believe the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.